Chapter 24 Chanting the Song Sung by Lord Shiva. Sage Maitreya continued, Vijitachva, the eldest son of Maharaj Prithu, who had a reputation like his father's, became emperor and gave his younger brothers different directions of the world to govern, for he was very affectionate toward his brothers. Maharaj Vijitachva offered the eastern part of the world to his brother Haryaksha the southern part to Dumarakesha, the western part to Rika, and the northern part to Dravina. Formerly, Maharaj Vichitashva pleased the king of heaven, Indra, and from him received the title Antardana. His wife's name was Shikandini, and by her he begot three good sons. The three sons of Maharaj Antardana were named Pavaka, Pavamana, and Shuchi. Formerly, these three personalities were the demigods of fire, but due to the curse of the great sage Vasishta, they became the sons of Maharaj Antardana. As such, they were as powerful as the fire gods, and they attained the destination of mystic yogic power, being again situated as the demigods of fire. Maharaj Antardana had another wife named Nabaspati, and by her he was happy to beget another son named Habirdana. Since Maharaj Antardana was very liberal, he did not kill Indra while the demigod was stealing his father's horse at the sacrifice. Whenever Antardana, the supreme royal power, had to exact taxes, punish his citizens, or fine them severely, he was not willing to do so. Consequently, he retired from the execution of such duties and engaged himself in the performance of different sacrifices. Although Maharaj Antardana was engaged in performing sacrifices, because he was a self-realized soul, he very intelligently rendered devotional service to the Lord, who eradicates all the fears of his devotees. By thus worshipping the Supreme Lord, Maharaj Antardana, wrapped in ecstasy, attained his planet very easily. Havirdana, the son of Maharaj Antardana, had a wife named Havirdani, who gave birth to six sons named Barishat, Gaya, Shukla, Krishna, Satya, and Jita Vrata. My dear Vidura, Havirdana's very powerful son named Barishat was very expert in performing various kinds of fruitive sacrifices and he was also expert in the practice of mystic yoga. By his great qualifications he became known as Prajapati. Maharaj Bhadishat executed many sacrifices all over the world. He scattered kusha grasses and kept the tops of the grasses pointed eastward. Maharaj Bhadishat, henceforward known as Prachina Bhari, was ordered by the supreme demigod Lord Brahma to marry the daughter of the ocean named Shatadruti. 
Her bodily features were completely beautiful, and she was very young. She was decorated with the proper garments, and when she came into the marriage arena and began circumambulating it, the fire god Agni became so attracted to her that he desired her company, exactly as he had formerly desired to enjoy Shuki. While Shata Druti was thus being married, the demons, the denizens of Gandharva Loka, the great sages, and the denizens of Siddhaloka, the earthly planets, and Nagaloka, although highly exalted, were all captivated by the tinkling of her ankle bells. King Prachinabari begot ten children in the womb of Shatadruti. All of them were equally endowed with religiosity, and all of them were known as the Prachetas. When all these Prachetas were ordered by their father to marry and beget children, they all entered the ocean and practiced austerities and penances for ten thousand years. Thus they worshipped the master of all austerity, the supreme personality of Godhead. When all the sons of Prachina Bari left home to execute austerities, they met Lord Shiva, who, out of great mercy, instructed them about the absolute truth. All the sons of Prachina Bari meditated upon the instructions, chanting and worshipping them with great care and attention. Vidura asked Maitreya, My dear Brahman, why did the Prachetas meet Lord Shiva on the way? Please tell me how the meeting happened, how Lord Shiva became very pleased with them, and how he instructed them. Certainly such talks are important, and I wish that you please be merciful upon me and describe them. O oh, best of the Brahmins, it is very difficult for living entities encaged within this material body to have personal contact with Lord Shiva. Even great sages who have no material attachments do not contact him, despite their always being absorbed in meditation to attain his personal contact. Lord Shiva, the most powerful demigod, second only to Lord Vishnu, is self-sufficient. Although he has nothing to aspire for in the material world, for the benefit of those in the material world, he is always busily engaged everywhere and is accompanied by his dangerous energies like Goddess Kali and Goddess Durga. My dear Vidura, because of their pious nature, all the sons of Prachina Bodhi very seriously accepted the words of their father with heart and soul. And with these words on their heads, they went toward the west to execute their father's order. While traveling, the Prachetas happened to see a great reservoir of water, which seemed almost as big as the ocean. The water of this lake was so calm and quiet that it seemed like the mind of a great soul, and its inhabitants, the aquatics, appeared very peaceful and happy to be under the protection of such a watery reservoir. In that great lake there were different types of lotus flowers. Oh, some of them were bluish, and some of them were red. Some of them grew at night, some in the day, and some, like the Indivara lotus flower, in the evening. Combined together, the lotus flowers filled the lake so full that the lake appeared to be a great mine of such flowers. Consequently, on the shores there were swans and cranes, Chakravaka, Karandava, and other beautiful water birds standing about. There were various trees and creepers on all sides of the lake, and there were mad bumblebees humming all about them. The trees appeared to be very jolly due to the sweet humming of the bumblebees, and the saffron, which was contained in the lotus flowers, was being thrown into the air. 
These all created such an atmosphere that it appeared as though a festival were taking place there. The sons of the king became very much amazed when they heard vibrations from various drums and kettle drums, along with other orderly musical sounds pleasing to the ear. The Purchetas were fortunate to see Lord Shiva, the chief of the demigods, emerging from the water with his associates. His bodily luster was just like molten gold. His throat was bluish, and he had three eyes, which looked very mercifully upon his devotees. He was accompanied by many musicians who were glorifying him. As soon as the Prachetas saw Lord Shiva, they immediately offered their obeisances in great amazement and fell down at the lotus feet of the Lord. Lord Shiva became very pleased with the Prachetas because generally Lord Shiva is the protector of pious persons and persons of gentle behavior. Being very much pleased with the princes, he began to speak as follows. You are all the sons of King Prachinabadi, and I wish all good fortune to you. I also know what you are going to do, and therefore I am visible to you just to show my mercy upon you. Any person who is surrendered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, the controller of everything, material nature as well as the living entity, is actually very dear to me. A person who executes his occupational duty properly for 100 births becomes qualified to occupy the post of Brahma. And if he becomes more qualified, he can approach Lord Shiva. A person who is directly surrendered to Lord Krishna or Vishnu in unalloyed devotional service is immediately promoted to the spiritual planets. Lord Shiva and other demigods attain these planets after the destruction of this material world. You are all devotees of the Lord, and as such, I appreciate that you are as respectable as the Supreme Personality of Godhead Himself. I know in this way that the devotees also respect me, and that I am dear to them. Thus no one can be as dear to the devotees as I am. Now I shall chant one mantra, which is not only transcendental, pure and auspicious, but is the best prayer for anyone who is aspiring to attain the ultimate goal of life. When I chant this mantra, please hear it carefully and attentively. Out of his causeless mercy, the exalted personality Lord Shiva, a great devotee of Lord Narayan, continued to speak to the king's sons who were standing with folded hands. Lord Shiva addressed the Supreme Personality of Godhead with the following prayer. O Supreme Personality, glories unto you. You are the most exalted of all self-realized souls. Since you are always auspicious for the self-realized, I wish that you be auspicious for me. You are worshipable by virtue of the all-perfect instructions you give. You are the Super-Soul. Therefore I offer my obeisances unto you as the Supreme Living Being. My Lord, you are the origin of the creation by virtue of the lotus flower, which sprouts from your navel. You are the supreme controller of the senses and the sense objects, and you are also the all-pervading Vasudeva. You are most peaceful, and because of your self-illuminated existence, you are not disturbed by the six kinds of trans... My dear Lord, you are the origin of the subtle material ingredients, the master of all integration, as well as the master of all disintegration the predominating deity named Sang Master of All Intelligence, known as the predominating deity Pradyumna. Therefore I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. My Lord, as the supreme directing deity known as Aniruddha, 
You are the master of the senses and the mind. I therefore offer my obeisances unto you again and again. You are known as Ananta as well as Sankarshan because of your ability to destroy the whole creation by the blazing fire from your mouth. My Lord, O Aniruddha, you are the authority by which the doors of the higher planetary systems and liberation are opened. You are always within the pure heart of the living entity. Therefore, I offer my obeisances unto you. You are the possessor of semen, which is like gold, and thus, in the form of fire, you help the Vedic sacrifices, beginning with Chatur Hotra. Therefore, I offer my obeisances unto you. My Lord, you are the provider of the Pitralokas as well as all the demigods. You are the predominating deity of the moon and the master of all three Vedas. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you because you are the original source of satisfaction for all living entities. My dear Lord, you are the gigantic universal form which contains all the individual bodies of the living entities. You are the maintainer of the three worlds and as such you maintain the mind, senses, body and air of life within them. I therefore offer my respectful obeisances unto you. My dear Lord, by expanding your transcendental vibrations, you reveal the actual meaning of everything. You are the all-pervading sky within and without, and you are the ultimate goal of pious activities executed both within this material world and beyond it. I therefore offer my respectful obeisances again and again unto you. My dear Lord, you are the viewer of the results of pious activities. You are inclination, disinclination, and their resultant activities. You are the cause of the miserable conditions of life caused by irreligion, and therefore you are death. I offer you my respectful obeisances. My dear Lord, you are the topmost of all bestowers of all benediction, the oldest and supreme enjoyer amongst all enjoyers. You are the master of all the world's metaphysical philosophy, for you are the supreme cause of all causes, Lord Krishna. You are the greatest of all religious principles, the supreme mind, and you have a brain which is never checked by any condition. Therefore, I repeatedly offer my obeisances unto you. My dear Lord, you are the supreme controller of the worker, sense activities, and the results of sense activities or karma. Therefore, you are the controller of the body, mind, and senses. You are also the supreme controller of egotism, known as Rudra. You are the source of knowledge and the activities of the Vedic injunctions. My dear Lord, I wish to see you exactly in the form that your very dear devotees worship. You have many other forms, but I wish to see your form that is especially liked by the devotees. Please be merciful upon me and show me that form, for only that form worshipped by the devotees can perfectly satisfy all the demands of the senses. The Lord's beauty resembles a dark cloud during the rainy season. As the rainfall glistens, his bodily features also glisten. Indeed, he is the sum total of all beauty. The Lord has four arms and an exquisitely beautiful face with eyes like lotus petals, a beautiful highly raised nose, a mind-attracting smile, a beautiful forehead, and equally beautiful and fully decorated ears. The Lord is super-excellently beautiful on account of his open and merciful smile and his sidelong glance upon his devotees. His black hair is curly, 
and his garments, waving in the wind, appear like flying saffron pollen from lotus flowers. His glittering earrings, shining helmet, bangles, garland, ankle bells, waist belt, and various other bodily ornaments combine with conch shell, disc, club, and lotus flower to increase the natural beauty of the Kostaba pearl on his chest. The Lord has shoulders just like a lion's. Upon these shoulders are garlands, necklaces, and epaulets, and all of these are always glittering. Besides these, there is the beauty of the Kostaba money pearl, and on the dark chest of the Lord there are streaks named Srivatsa, which are signs of the goddess of fortune. The glittering of these streaks excels the beauty of the golden streaks on a gold-testing stone. Indeed, such beauty defeats a gold-testing stone. The Lord's abdomen is beautiful due to the three ripples in the flesh. Being so round, his abdomen resembles the leaf of a banyan tree, and when he exhales and inhales, the movement of the ripples appears very, very beautiful. The coils within the navel of the Lord are so deep that it appears that the entire universe sprouted out of it and yet again wishes to go back. The lower part of the Lord's waist is dark and covered with yellow garments and a belt bedecked with golden embroidery work. His symmetrical lotus feet and the calves, thighs and joints of his legs are extraordinarily beautiful. Indeed, the Lord's entire body appears to be well built. My dear Lord, your two lotus feet are so beautiful that they appear like two blossoming petals of the lotus flower, which grows during the autumn season. Indeed, the nails of your lotus feet emanate such a great effulgence that they immediately dissipate all the darkness in the heart of a conditioned soul. My dear Lord, kindly show me that form of yours which always dissipates all kinds of darkness in the heart of a devotee. My dear Lord, you are the supreme spiritual master of everyone. Therefore, all conditioned souls covered with the darkness of ignorance can be enlightened by you as the spiritual master. My dear Lord, those who desire to purify their existence must always engage in meditation upon your lotus feet, as described above. Those who are serious about executing their occupational duties and who want freedom from fear must take to this process of bhakti yoga. My dear Lord, the king in charge of the heavenly kingdom is also desirous of obtaining the ultimate goal of life, devotional service. Similarly, you are the ultimate destination of those who identify themselves with you, Aham Brahmasmi. However, it is very difficult for them to attain you, whereas a devotee can very easily attain your lordship. My dear Lord, pure devotional service is even difficult for liberated persons to discharge, but devotional service alone can satisfy you. Who will take to other processes of self-realization if he is actually serious about the perfection of life? Simply by expansion of his eyebrows, invincible time personified can immediately vanquish the entire universe. However, formidable time does not approach the devotee who has taken complete shelter at your lotus feet. If one, by chance, associates with a devotee even for a fraction of a moment, he no longer is subject to attraction by the results of karma or jnana. What interest, then, can he have in the benedictions of the demigods who are subject to the laws of birth and death? My dear Lord, your lotus feet are the cause of all auspicious things and the destroyer of all the contamination of sin. 
I therefore beg your lordship to bless me by the association of your devotees, who are completely purified by worshipping your lotus feet, and who are so merciful upon the conditioned souls. I think that your real benediction will be to allow me to associate with such devotees. The devotee whose heart has been completely cleansed by the process of devotional service and who is favored by Bhakti Devi does not become bewildered by the external energy which is just like a dark well. Being completely cleansed of all material contamination in this way, a devotee is able to understand very happily your name, fame, form, activities, etc. My dear Lord, the impersonal Brahman spreads everywhere, like the sunshine or the sky. And that impersonal Brahman, which spreads throughout the universe, and in which the entire universe is manifested, is you. My dear Lord, you have manifold energies, and these energies are manifested in manifold forms. With such energies, you have also created this cosmic manifestation, and although you maintain it as if it were permanent, you ultimately annihilate it. Although you are never disturbed by such changes and alterations, the living entities are disturbed by them, and therefore they find the cosmic manifestation to be different or separated from you. My Lord, you are always independent, and I can clearly see this fact. My dear Lord, your universal form consists of all five elements, the senses, mind, intelligence, false ego, which is material, and the Paramatma, your partial expansion, who is the director of everything. Yogis other than the devotees, namely the Karma Yogi and Jnana Yogi, worship you by their respective actions in their respective positions. It is stated both in the Vedas and in the Shastras that are corollaries of the Vedas, and indeed everywhere, that it is only you who are to be worshipped. That is the expert version of all the Vedas. My dear Lord, you are the only Supreme Person the cause of all causes. Before the creation of this material world, your material energy remains in a dormant condition. When your material energy is agitated, the three qualities, namely goodness, passion, and ignorance, act, and as a result, the total material energy, egotism, ether, air, fire, water, earth, and all the various demigods and saintly persons, becomes manifest. Thus the material world is created. My dear Lord, after creating by your own potencies, you enter within the creation in four kinds of forms. Being within the hearts of the living entities, you know them and know how they are enjoying their senses. The so-called happiness of this material creation is exactly like the bee's enjoyment of honey after it has been collected in the honeycomb. My dear Lord, your absolute authority cannot be directly experienced, but one can guess by seeing the activities of the world that everything is being destroyed in due course of time. The force of time is very strong, and everything is being destroyed by something else, just as one animal is being eaten by another animal. Time scatters everything, exactly as the wind scatters clouds in the sky. My dear Lord, all living entities within this material world are mad after planning for things, and they are always busy with the desire to do this or that. This is due to uncontrollable greed. The greed for material enjoyment is always existing in the living entity, but your lordship is always alert, and in due course of time you strike him, just as a snake seizes a mouse and very easily swallows him. 
My dear Lord, any learned person knows that unless he worships you, his entire life is spoiled. Knowing this, how could he give up worshipping your lotus feet? Even our father and spiritual master, Lord Brahma, unhesitatingly worshipped you, and the fourteen manos followed in his footsteps. My dear Lord, all actually learned persons know you as the Supreme Brahman and the Super Soul. Although the entire universe is afraid of Lord Rudra, who ultimately annihilates everything, for the learned devotees, you are the fearless destination of all. My dear sons of the king, just execute your occupational duty as kings with a pure heart. Just chant this prayer, fixing your mind on the lotus feet of the Lord. That will bring you all good fortune, for the Lord will be very much pleased with you. Therefore, O sons of the King, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hadi, is situated in everyone's heart. He is also within your hearts. Therefore, chant the glories of the Lord, and always meditate upon Him continuously. My dear princes, in the form of a prayer, I have delineated the yoga system of chanting the holy name. All of you should take this important stotra, or prayer, within your minds, and promise to keep it in order to become great sages. By acting silently, like a great sage, and by giving attention and reverence, you should practice this method. This prayer was first spoken to us by Lord Brahma, the master of all creators. The creators, headed by Bhrigu, were instructed in these prayers because they wanted to create. When all the prajapatis were ordered to create by Lord Brahma, we chanted these prayers in praise of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and became completely free from all ignorance. Thus we were able to create different types of living entities. A devotee of Lord Krishna, whose mind is always absorbed in him, who with great attention and reverence chants this stotra, or prayer, will achieve the greatest perfection of life without delay. In this material world, there are different types of achievement, but of all of them, the achievement of knowledge is considered to be the highest, because one can cross the ocean of nations only on the boat of knowledge. Otherwise, the ocean is impassable. Although rendering devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead and worshipping Him are very difficult, if one vibrates or simply reads this stotra, composed and sung by me, he will very easily be able to invoke the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is the dearmost objective of all auspicious benedictions. A human being who sings this song, sung by me, can please the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Such a devotee, being fixed in the Lord's devotional service, can acquire whatever he wants from the Lord. A devotee who rises early in the morning and with folded hands chants these prayers sung by Lord Shiva and gives facility to others to hear them, certainly becomes free from all bondage to fruitive activities. My dear sons of the King, the prayers I have recited to you are meant for pleasing the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Super Soul. I advise you to recite these prayers which are as effective as great austerities. In this way, when you are mature, your life will be successful, and you will certainly achieve all your desired objectives without fail.
Thus ends the 24th chapter of the 4th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, Chanting the Song Sung by Lord Shiva.